Um, uh, um, really excited to have Colin. F feel very privileged to have Colin Speedy to come along and, and talk to us tonight. But but I'm not going to be part of that conversation. Um, uh, as you're chatting, as the chat's going on, um, uh, there's if you've got any questions that come up about anything that Colin has been talking about, please use the Q. Please use the Q and A button on the bottom of the screen. So there's a chat button, and that's for chat. So you guys can chat amongst yourselves. But if you've got a specific question for Colin, please put it in the Q and A. Um, I'm going to keep a, an eye on those, and then uh, at the end of the presentation, or perhaps periodically, Colin will stop. Uh, and then we'll be able to ask him the questions as we go along. Uh, and that's it for me. So thank you very much. I'll hand you over to, oh, I, I'll also, I'll introduce Claire. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, Dr. Claire Etock has very kindly come along um, to be a, um, a assist with Colin. Uh, and she's um, she's there to help with questions. Um, the uh, Another technical point is that because Cal Colin is a very, beautiful part of the west of Scotland that Wi-Fi doesn't really extend very well to. Um, if it's not very work, working very well for the Q&A, Claire is here to assist with that. So um, I will pass you over to Norma to, to, to do the rest of it. So thanks very much. Thanks, Steve. Um, so I'm Norma McLeod. Some of you might know me that I run Immersed Hebrides, an outdoor swimming business in the Outer Hebrides. Um, we're surrounded by sea and so um, I am the open water swimmer out of me and Steve, but he he has vast years of experience in the sea. Um, so we, we have decided to do this webinar because obviously there's lots of, we have lots of contact um, with marine mammals when we're in the sea, mostly shore based ones and they're quite curious as we know. Um, so I think Colin Speedy is going to raise the awareness for us what we should be looking out for safety wise for the marine mammals as well as ourselves and he's going to do um, a chat about that just now and if you don't know who Colin is he's the founder of the Y scheme um, and that's the UK's national marine ecotour ecotourism training and accreditation scheme for um, motorcraft. Now you can correct me Colin if I get anything wrong here um, he's also got a really good interest in basking sharks as well. Um, he was the director of the Wildlife Trust Bask Basking Shark Project from 2002 to 2007. Um, and so he's nearly covered, with that team, he nearly covered 25,000 kilometres of effort-based surveys between the English Channel and the Outer Hebrides aboard the Qatar Forever Changes. So he's got years and years of experience, plus he has um, published his own book, um, titled A Sea Monster's Tale, and there's a link, um, we can send a link out to you in search of the basking shark, which is something I'm definitely going to buy now. So Colin, I'm going to hand over to you now, and what I will do, my purpose is, is there's the questions that you submitted when you registered, I have them here, and I've, I've summarised some of them, because a lot of them were the same, but I will put them to Colin, and we will also uh, do it through the Q&A as well, live. So over to you, Colin, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, the uh, experience of uh, talking about where, how you can handle yourselves around wildlife and minimize disturbance. Because ultimately, we all want to enjoy wildlife. But it, what's critical is that wildlife is uh, not disturbed by us. So basically, what I've been doing over the years, after a long time spent in uh, skippering yachts on research projects, was to put together what's called the Y scheme, um, which trains and accredits um, businesses at different levels. Uh, we have different levels of courses. We have a standard course which covers boats. We have uh, a master course for people who are very specialized. And Claire has been developing people and wild swimmers and so on. So we, we cover a lot of areas. So what I'm going to do tonight is to explain in very much shorthand, uh, how animals react to us, look at the legal aspects to protect you, and look at it from the point of view of the ethical values uh, of going out around wildlife, but also to the practical and safety elements. So uh, yeah, let's go off on this uh, voyage of discovery. So this you can see is a basking shark. This is what we're gonna be looking at today, basking sharks, whales and dolphins, seabirds and seals. And the idea is that it, I will touch on, on each of them. And also, too, some other things that you're bound to encounter when you're going around the shores with otters. Now, I'm focusing on, uh, if you like, a Scotland-based 
course here tonight, but most of the most of the messages in this are equally applicable wherever you are, uh, particular areas. And our partners up here in the west of Scotland, Hebridean Well and Dolphin Trust, are along tonight too. And maybe if, if necessary, they can answer some questions. So let's go. Next one, please. Okay, this is a this is a basking shark. Now, this is the second largest fish in the world. Uh, they could potentially reach as much as 12 meters. Biggest normally that you'll see in, in British waters are around 10. Um, but uh, these are a colossal creature and they're part and part of our, of our native fauna. Uh, indeed, Scotland has just um, created the first marine protected area for the basking shark. And uh, that, that is the first, but they're a highly protected species, very unique uh, to the UK. It's probably the best place in the world to actually come and see a basking shark at the surface. They're not always very visible. As you can see from this clip, uh, what you may see from a distance is the fin. Um, and this shark is feeding. They are a, a ram filter feeder, feeding only on plankton. This one's swimming along, filtering out plankton with its gill rakers. And uh, they're fairly slow swimming and they're very docile, but of course they're very big and they're very powerful. So there are elements to be careful around that. Next slide, please. Okay, so this slide isn't meant to intimidate you, but it does show that this is a very, very important creature. They're classified as in danger, not just in the Northeast Atlantic now, but globally. And that is because they were hunted very extensively for centuries. And that depleted the numbers drastically, um, very much so in the, in the Northeast Atlantic, which includes our area here. And so they're highly protected in the UK. Now, not, it's not just a question of protecting the shark because it's, an, it's a nice thing to have around. It's also very valuable in ecotourism terms. Lots of people travel from very far away to come and see basking sharks. So this is a highly protected animal. And the key thing to look at here perhaps is protected against reckless or intentional disturbance. And that really covers the physical activities of boat handlers and people in the water and so on and so forth. So next slide, please. Now, where do you find them? Water and basking sharks. If you uh, imagine that basking sharks like shallow and very tidal water, so, um, that's where you're likely to find them. Now, this lighthouse you can see in the background is an amazing place called the High Skier, which is partway between the Isle of Rum and Barra. And uh, it's one of the best places in the world for seeing basking sharks. Nobody ever goes there. We, we were working very much throughout that area. And we found that this was a still viable hotspot for basking sharks, uh, which was an area, this area was extensively hunted too. And so the sharks are, are still there and often in substantial numbers. And they like areas where there's a lot of water turnover. So for example, when in the Minch where you have and so on and so forth, if you like, tumbling the water, mixing it up, lots of nutrients, lots of plankton, and the sharks home in on that. And we know now that the, many of the sharks that are seen one year return in, in subsequent years to this particular area. So it's a particularly important area, and it's now part of the Sea of the Hebrides MPA for minke whales and basking sharks, so it's, it's highly important. Now bear in mind that from the point of view of, of anybody in the water, if you're in these strongly tidal areas, you wanna make sure that you're well supported with, with a boat and backup because uh, you know, this, is, this is fairly challenging stuff. Um, and also too, it's worth bearing in mind that when sharks are in these areas, they're feeding on the densest patches of plankton, which means often that the water is very turbid. So even if you were relatively close to a shark, uh, you wouldn't necessarily see it until it was right on top of you. And actually the shark is unlikely to see you too. So that's something to bear in mind. Next slide, please. So sharks in these areas go through some amazing behavior. It's fantastic to watch. This is what we call courtship behavior. Many of the people who said they saw plesiosaurs like the Loch Ness Monster must have been looking at courting basking sharks. And they swim often in long strings, nose to tail. And when you look down in the water, you can often see that there are many more sharks underneath them. 
Um, and so this is important behavior. We think that it, it, it may be connected to, uh, to reproduction um, and maybe one of the reasons that the sharks actually come to these areas. It's abundant food, potential chances to meet mates. They don't stick together necessarily when they disperse in winter. So when they return here, the potential things. So it would be very important not to get too close to animals involved in this type of behavior because it might have significant effects on that behavior. Next slide, please. Now, unbelievably, basking sharks also breach. This was taken again out at the high skier. That's the massif of rum in the background there. And uh, it's a, an incredible thing. These animals can weigh up to seven tons in weight and they come out of the water like a, a very unstable Polaris missile. And they have absolutely no idea that you're there. I've had one breach right beside the boat uh, and put water all over the deck. And, and we had no idea that there were even sharks around us. They are not the brightest or sharpest knives in the drawer. They have a brain the size of a walnut and they're very, very uh, limited in their, their understanding of, of other boats and people and, uh, and other sharks even being around them. So, you know, if you see a shark breach, you have to move out of the way. Uh, they have been known to land on boats. There was a report from Ardna Merkin in the 19th birth in Cornwall, uh, again, from 19, 1966, where the shark actually landed on a boat. And it's actually the only recorded fatality that I know of from sharks in the UK occurred in the Firth of Clyde in 1937, when uh, a small boat that was watching sharks off Carradale was tipped over by a shark breaching and it hit the boat on the way up, tipped a load of people in the water and a couple of adults and several children died. So it's that there is a significant risk being around these animals. They are, they are huge and they are potentially risky. Next slide, please. And they are not easy to disturb, but they don't give you any warning when they are getting disturbed. We were a good distance away from this particular shark when we filmed it, and it suddenly started lashing out with its tail and dived. And sometimes that means that the shark is actually going to breach shortly afterwards. But in this instance, it wasn't. We were certainly there to, to actually do this work, uh, and the shark suddenly spooked. Something must have, something to do with our presence must have caused that. But you've got to imagine that an animal that can launch itself seven tons of itself out of the water, you know, has got some immense power and it, it doesn't pay to be anywhere near the tail of a basking shark because it would incapacitate you or injure you. Next slide, please. So codes of conduct with swimmers. There's a lot of, uh, unless you're in really good condition with, with the, the right type of backup, it doesn't pay to necessarily too close to these animals. Uh, and certainly from the point of view of uh, the type of tidal areas that uh, the sharks are found in, it, it, it can be intimidating. It's also true to say that divers in the water often report that they're quite scared when they get to see the basking shark looming out of the plankton rich water uh, because they are immense and it's like a jet engine swimming towards you. So the Shark Trust Code of Conduct recommends that no more than four people should be within 100 meters of sharks and to stay in a group at the surface of the water. Don't swim towards or across the sharks. They literally can turn on a sixpence and they are unpredictable in their movements. So stay away to one side and you know, see what you can because as I said, the water is often very turbid. Um, and let the sharks swim by. And, and get a view. Don't touch basking sharks at all. They have uh, what are called denticles on their skin, which are incredibly abrasive and uh, will certainly take the skin off your hand. And then again, ultimately, if you're that close to the shark, you have to beware of the tail um, because if one takes, it gets spooked by you and takes a swipe, then uh, you know, you're in deep trouble. Next slide, please. Now, while I stop here, has anybody got any questions?
Uh, yeah, Colin, there's a couple come in. Um, there's somebody's asked a question. Do basking sharks travel and live in groups? No, not necessarily. It looks like when they when they leave the Hebrides, let's say, they not the majority of them head off into deeper water west of the outer Hebrides and head out towards the continental shelf. And they make exploratory dives down to as much as 1300 meters or more. Uh, foraging for plankton in deep water. And they, a lot of them spend time on the shelf edge. Some of them disappear off down to the south and end up off Portugal and Morocco. Wow. <laughs> uh, others tend to hang around the Hades. The satellite tracking program that was carried out by the University of Exeter answered a thousand questions. That doesn't mean we know it all. Every time you answer one question, three more pop up. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, they, it, it's safe to say, it, but from what we understand, these are, to some degree, our sharks. Um, and Western Ireland is another great place, Isle of Man. Um, but the, the British Isles are the place to see busking sharks. Okay, thank you for that. And can they swim in uh, shallow water? Um, there's a question there, how shallow or depth of water do you, bask, do you find basking sharks? And I think that's probably for the swimmers if they're within depth. <laughs> Yeah, they'll swim. I've seen them swim in and literally realise that they were about to land on the on the beach. Wow. Um, I was up at Harlin Bay, which Steve will know very well, on the north coast of Cornwall one day filming them, uh, and there were about thirty had come into the bay, and literally they were coming in, and I could see their pectoral fins skidding the bottom. I could see the wow. marks. Wow. Uh, they often spook badly when they get into shallow. They suddenly wake up and think, "I shouldn't be here." Yeah. Um, and I know a friend of mine saw one come right into the main channel at the entrance of Parsig, and uh, it, it touched the bottom and then side breached out, out to get out the way. My goodness. So they can come into very shallow water. If the plankton drift to some sheltered bay, they may well go into. Wow. That's really interesting and good for swimmers okay. to know that, you know, and obviously the power of a basking shark's tail, um, if they do come in, then, you know, it's just basically get, get out of the way. Um, it would be lovely to swim with them, but I think the, the safety advice would be to, just to get out of the way. Um, do, they, do they appear on the North Sea coast at all? Yeah, I, I, yeah, this year for the first time in a long time, they've been seeing them. And it's been rather strange in a way that that we haven't heard of them appearing in the North Sea so much because they certainly used to be there, uh, down off the, uh, the coast of Banff and Aberdeen on a lot of the same plant and the herring do. So, you know, it, the surprise is that it may be being that they haven't, but numbers in the Northeast Atlantic were drastically depleted and that may have something to do with their, their lack of appearance. But we, we are hopeful that numbers are recovering to some degree and, uh, you know, there's uh, certainly Scotland has had some fantastic years from since 2003. The numbers have been pretty, pretty strong, if not always remarkable. That's good to hear. And one last question on this topic um, before you move on. What is there a time of year that you're likely to see them? And this one's specifically for Cornwall from Elizabeth. Yeah, Cornwall's early. Um, and sadly, Cornwall hasn't really been very good for an awful long time. I was doing surveys in Cornish water since the 1980s. And um, it comes and goes in Cornwall. You, you, uh, it's connected to a climatic condition called the North Atlantic Oscillation to some degree. And um, at certain times, the, the sharks favour the south of Britain and other times they favour the north. Okay. Last period that we had really good sightings in around Cornwall. The very late 90s and early thousands, um, but you're looking at any time from April onwards until water stratifies uh, later on in the summer, and then you're not likely to see them. But it hasn't been good for years. It's a shame. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for all those answering all those questions. We'll probably let you move on to the next one. And for those who have questions, there we'll try and come back to them at the end if we have time. Uh, so this is a this is a harbour porpoise. What are what are the cetaceans, the whales and dolphins that you are most likely to see close to shore? Well, probably the most common is this little guy, harbour porpoise. They're up to about two meters long. They're very shy though. You often see them in around the edges and the tails of tide races off headlands, um, and they uh, they're pretty boat verse. So boats that 
try to watch them often find that the porpoise will dive here behind you. And they're not a social animal. Very occasionally one will, will turn towards a boat, but it's, it's extremely uncommon. Maybe sort of 1% of the time, I would say something like that. Um, but uh, one thing to bear in mind with all whales and dolphins, of course, is that there is another uh, feature involved here, and that is sound, because they use sound to communicate and to find their prey. And so uh, they use high frequency sound in the case of bottlenose dolphins and harp porpoises to locate their prey and to uh, communicate with each other. And if that sound gets masked by boat noise, for example, then that can have a, a factor in terms of disturbance. Now, it's worth remembering, too, that with all cetaceans, they're very highly protected and they're protected uh, by, largely by what was the habitats regulations of the EU, which are being transferred into Scottish law. And uh, 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 so they are, as I say, a highly protected species. So uh, next question. Uh, next slide, please. Protected species, obviously, with Brexit. We are seeing um, alterations in the law, but effectively, by and large, I don't think there's going to be much change in the actual values themselves. And as I say, in Scotland, they're, they're transferring the Habitats directory, uh, Directive across pretty much intact to ensure that there is continuity and the animals are well protected. Uh, and in Scotland, too, you have the Nature Conservation Act. And then there is the, the very useful uh, Scottish Marine Wildlife Watching Code. Um, which is a, a great example of uh, a useful practical code for all of yourselves who are out there. And uh, I'd love to see that transferred out into the other devolved nations, uh, England and uh, Northern Ireland and uh, Wales as well, because it, it is a very, very effective code and it's well thought through. And the Nature Conservation Act, again, we come back to this concept of reckless or intentional disturbance. Next slide, please. Now, uh, one of our most attractive um, cetacean species is the bottlenose dolphin. And it's the one that you're most likely to see from very close to the shore, because oftentimes, indeed, uh, you may well have seen them in bays around the UK. They used to be far more numerous after World War II and in, in many of the uh, major popular bays around the UK but um, there seems to be a consistent decline and so numbers are now very small around the UK. The most the best known of them would be in West Wales in Cardigan Bay uh, in the area around Newquay and certainly in the Murray Firth uh, where there's a, the, la the most northerly resident bottlenose dolphin population, big chunky animals and they are hefty, they can, they can be up to uh, three quarters of a ton they're a substantial creature, and after a family group, this is a, two adults, presumably females, one small calf and one adolescent, and they often stick very close together. Now, they will bow ride on occasion, but uh, and sometimes they, they just want to be left alone. They're very sensitive to noise. They don't like having boats and activity around them, especially when they've got calves present. Um, there are very strong bonds, uh, parental bonds with them. So they are the animal you're most likely to see, but you're unlikely to get close to them. Uh, even, even with very careful boat handling, it's quite unusual with these uh, family groups that, that, that they will come to you. It's often younger animals and, and, and some of the older animals that will come and play around the bow of the boat. So next slide, please. Now, this is bow riding, and there's an interesting uh, aspect of talking about bow riding, and that is that who is playing with who? You know, we like to watch the animals, but if you're on a boat, if the, if the dolphins come to you, that's one thing. They have chosen to come to you. The other side of that coin is if they're feet of them, they, move, they may move away, and then you start getting into the realm of potential disturbance. And uh, so if the animals come to you, generally it's on their terms and let them bow ride with you. And when they move away, let them go. Because again, that is the moment when 
your enjoyable relationship with the animal changes into something which is not necessarily for its benefit. Uh, but uh, bottlenose dolphins will uh, bow ride. If you're, on, if you're in a boat, the most important thing is to maintain your course and speed. Don't make sudden changes. Don't go too fast. Um, they don't necessarily stay with you for all that length of time. They'll often come along and travel for a few hundred meters and then move away. It's a wonderful experience, but when they move away, let them go. Um, many of you will know too, though, that there are what are called social, uh, solitary social uh, animals, spotless dolphins. And some of them will interact with swimmers, um, others less so. It's not always uh, an ideal relationship. Uh, some of these animals are pretty strange and will come up and touch the propellers of boats. Uh, others are quite aggressive. They tend to form a pecking order of, with the people who they have, have swum with in particular areas. When an animal takes up residence, as we had in Cornwall, we had a, a, an animal called Don Donald in one place and Beaky in another. And he had his favorites who went in the water with him and other people went in the water with him and he was pretty aggressive. And the one Freddy that was off Amble in Humberside really was quite aggressive and in one of the only sexual assaults on humans involved with a, with a dolphin. So and their behavior is very strange at times and it's best to be very careful around them. Um, because animals like the one in Fungi and Dable were relatively friendly does not mean they all are. So, and the other thing too, people in the water are interacting with some of these animals. It's very difficult uh, to tell what's happening and oftentimes uh, it can lead to reports of uh, disturbance of the animals. And there have been several cases of that uh, around the UK at, at different levels, one involving speedboats, uh, another one involving two guys who, who went in the water to swim with a bottle and stuff. So, uh, as I say, what you see on the poster and what you read on the in, on, uh, in the chat room aren't always so. Animals don't necessarily always welcome our presence. Okay, next please. And this is what this is what disturbance unfortunately looks like. And it's not necessarily the case that people set out to do this kind of thing deliberately because everybody loves these animals and everybody wants to see them. But the question is, as I mentioned already, do they always want to see us? And they don't always want to see us. So you have to be very sensitive and enjoy what is a remarkable and joyous experience without getting too close or staying too long. It's also true that the more boats that are involved or the more people that are involved, the greater the risk of disturbance. So, yeah, you know, if there are more than, say, two boats there, don't join in, keep your distance and stay away uh, and let the animals behave naturally and, and enjoy it. a fabulous experience. Next, please. Uh, common dolphins. Common dolphins have become uh, much more common in, in the Hebrides. When I was first working up in, uh, in the Hebrides, we used to see a lot of white-beaked dolphins and a lot of white-sided dolphins, but we never really saw many common dolphins. Uh, that's completely changed. Uh, different prey around and common dolphins have been moving in strongly. You'll often see them, you'll also see them in the English Channel, uh, it's particularly the Western Channel. Um, you'll also see them uh, off uh, in, in the uh, Southern Irish Sea and, and uh, the Celtic Sea, where there are considerable numbers. Uh, and they're smaller than the bottlenose dolphin with these lovely hourglass markings on the body, and they're very ready to bow ride. Uh, next slide, please. And much more playful. This is a very um, common dolphin calf that couldn't wait to chase and catch up with our boat and um, was lucky enough to get this, this picture. So dolphins are not all the same. They have different habitats, they have different preferences and they need to be treated with that kind of respect. And the, if you don't know what the animals are that you're looking at, keep your distance and watch that way because you, you really don't know what's what. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and up, up off uh, the Hebrides, the outer Hebrides, particularly on the uh, eastern side of Lewis, um, 
the lovely Rousseau's dolphin is likely to be encountered. And um, these really are one of the nicest of the dolphins. So certainly my favorite because they're very docile and quite intriguing. Um, and they're often in groups and many of them are known to us because they have these toothrate markings on their bodies and on their fins, which help us to photo identify them. And uh, oftentimes with calves, but they're very shy. They're a deep diving species. They'll stay underwater for considerable amounts of time and they don't necessarily welcome contact. Um, and the more, the more likely you are to get a good look at them because oftentimes if they work up enough nerve, they'll come and take a peek at the boat, for example. But certainly they, they can be seen from the shore. They do come fairly close in um, and they're a lovely feature of our, our uh, waters. Next slide, please. Um, and of course, now we have plenty of whales around as well. Uh, this is out off Skye. And this was a juvenile minke whale that came to bow ride with us and uh, followed us for a couple of hours. Now, the minke whale is the smallest of the baleen whales. It's the smallest of the blue whale family. And uh, they're pretty much widespread around the UK now. When I was first working in the English Channel, we, we never saw them. But now they're seen very regularly. And uh, numbers in Scotland seem to be increasing elsewhere, certainly through the Irish Sea and in the Western approaches. Um, and also, too, in more recent years, in the last 20 years or so, the number of humpback sightings and indeed whale sightings has increased dramatically, especially around the North Ear and Shetland, for example, but certainly off uh, Southwest Ireland, where now, fin whales and, and uh, humpbacks are a regular occurrence, but they're appearing everywhere. And, and it was no joke that we were talking about the humpback in Cornwall that's been around for the last few weeks. So they're there. And there's good news as well as bad about uh, populations, and they seem to be moving into our waters regularly. Next slide, please. One of the most important things that we can do as individuals is to report what we see, because that helps us to build a better picture of what's going on around the UK. And it tells us that there are many things going on. Uh, many of you will have taken part in the Great Sea Watch Foundation, um, National Whale and Dolphin Watch or Orca Watch. Um, and it, the, this is a week when uh, recordings are made from all around the UK, which gives a really good pattern of what is being seen. But even if you just out casually and you see something with a shawl, do report it. And so simple data where you were, the site you were, what they were, even better. Get pictures, you know, even modern day phone cameras are pretty good for getting something which is pretty usable. Um, and report it to people like Hebride and Mellon Trust who are conducting regular surveys and really are the, the authoritative people within the West Scotland. As I say, Sea Watch Foundation around the Cape are covering um, lots and lots of information and building it up to create policy that will protect animals for the future. Um, one of the great developments in reason has been that of the app. Uh, so that helps you to record what you see and it adds a whole dimension to what you do. And as I say, in the West of Scotland here, the Whale Track app uh, is, is a wonderful thing. Um, contact HWDT to find out more. Uh, and certainly around the rest of the UK, equally contact Sea Watch Foundation, who have uh, a similar device which covers the larger area. So you can become part of that recording project and become part of the solution. It's a good thing. Uh, any questions? Um, thanks for that, Colin. I think um, it's really important, you know, as swimmers, when we enter the water, often we're just thinking about our swim um, and we take plenty pictures as well. So if we do see something, you know, it's un unusual for us to capture something decent, but to be to know where to send our pictures to rather than just Facebook and social media. And um, I, I would definitely be encouraging that on my, on my own groups. Um, so thank you for sharing all of that information. Um, we've got a lot of different questions, which Claire has been okay. very kindly answering. <laughs> um, I'm just seeing if there's anything. How Good. common, common is it to see orcas around Scotland? Um, I don't Good. know. If we're moving well, on. 
the best place to see them regularly, I suspect, is Shetland, yeah. um, where they seem to be getting lots of regular sightings. Uh, there is a west coast of Scotland pod, and indeed, the first time I ever saw an orca was, was up north of Skye uh, on a lousy day, <laughs> and it just made the sun come out. And uh, he was, there is a, an elderly bull called John Coe, and in 1992, he was already a piece of ram. But there's really a lot of concern about the future for the West Coast of Scotland group because um, they don't seem to be reproducing, probably because of high levels of pollutants uh, in their bodies. Uh, these apex predators like orcas tend to suffer very badly from bioaccumulation of, of toxins from the food that they eat something that we ought to take note of too. Um, and uh, unfortunately that can affect their reproductive capacity. And I think I'm right in saying that there hasn't been a calf reported born to this group for 30 mm. years or more. Oh my goodness. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the females was recently stranded and was found to be in a basically toxic waste. So, I mean, there are serious concerns about things that we don't even consider. We don't see pollutants like that, but that's their effect. My goodness. But they are amazing and uh, certainly one of the great in the wild. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I've, I've never seen one. I, Next one. You, you imagine that you see them when you're swimming because <laughs> these are the biggest mammals. Um, and, and I do remember a story in Shetland, and this was one of the questions. Well, Sorry. Hmm. No, go ahead. Um, one of the questions um, there was uh, there was a video shared of um, orcas hunting a seal in a bay, and possibly this bay could have been a bay that swimmers frequent. And they were wondering if they were in the water at the same time while the orcas were on a hunt, would they have been attacked? There are I, I know of no records of uh, direct attacks on humans, which is perhaps surprising. Uh, and especially humans in wetsuits. Uh, I mean, why not? They look awfully like seals to me. Um, <laughs> that's not but what we there have been yeah. attacks on boats. Uh, that's an interesting. No, I'm I'm sure it's not. But no, what I'm saying is nobody seems to be eaten yet. So let's yeah. let's be uh, optimistic about that. But in recent times, there's been a spate off the coast of Spain and Portugal this summer. Uh, this last summer there were several attacks on boats where rudders were disabled on the boats and things like that and nobody really knows why uh, these are highly intelligent creatures they're very very social bonds between them and uh, you know they, we, there are still immense amounts we don't understand about them um, but you know if you get lucky enough to see them in the wild it's the ultimate thing in many ways they are yeah there's one other question before you move on as well um apart from tail agitation what are the signs to look look for of anxiety um or aggression in a mammal uh well that depends very much on the different species i mean tail slapping is is a, an obvious as well that when folks get too close and things like that they'll slap the tail sudden dives evasive action uh, sudden course alterations you know, grouping together speeding up all that suggests the animals are agitated so you know as soon as you start to see those kind of behaviors it's time to move away and yeah let the animals settle down um because going beyond that causes disturbance and then you know you could fall foul of the law um so there is that side of it but of course none of us would want to do it anyway uh, I would say that everybody that is, has come along tonight would be wanting a positive experience both both ways. So uh, the important thing is, and watch from a distance. It, it, it's extraordinary enough as it is. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, other questions we'll try and answer as we continue or or at the end. So if you want to proceed, Colin. Great. Thanks. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're on, on to seals. Now, for you guys as wild swimmers, uh, 
the big impact is potentially an interface between the sea and the land. And that is because many of the species that are most beautiful around the coastline spend time on land as much as in the sea. In the case of the seals, uh, they're very much uh, protected now, although they weren't so in the past. And uh, so, you know, we need to be uh, aware of that. But they're an important part of our native fauna. Next slide, please. So we have two types of seals in the UK, the grey seal, and Britain is the epicenter of, for, of grey seals, something like 40% of the world's population uh, in the UK, 95% of the EU population in the UK, uh, and they are a, a substantial creature. This is a, a big bull here, pulled out on a rock at low water, uh, and they can be 300 kilos. Uh, it's a big, hefty animal. Next slide, please. Female grey seal, seal. Uh, and as you might expect, much better looking than the male. And this lovely area of pattern on the neck, uh, the gorget is, is used for photo identifying individual animals. And um, this one's just hauling out, got her feathers up out of the water because they lose heat through them. Um, and they haul out um, during the day, especially uh, at low water, when they can often be well uh, away from the water. So they are vulnerable when they're hauled out, but they're hauled out just the food to warm up and, and to rest. Next slide, please. And this is a common or harbor seal. And these guys are smaller with this little, what I think looks like a, a, a sort of puppy face. Um, and very, very pretty. This one's uh, on the skin. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the difference with them perhaps is that gray seals are probably more uh, offshore and harbor seals are more inshore. They're the ones that you'll find in very sheltered waters. Sometimes though, there's a crossover. Uh, and here you've got a gray seal uh, female in the foreground and two harbor seals in the background. Um, so they do uh, interface. And for those of you down south, you know, they're, they're now moving slowly but surely further west again. So harbor seals now have been seen in the River X, uh, where, as in the past, you know, that, that was something we certainly never know, saw when I was living down there. Um, and you know, in Pool Harbor, for example. Uh, gray seals west of that, down around Cornwall, big population in Pembrokeshire. Uh, in Scotland, you're looking at the Tresham Shires, you're looking at the Monarchs, you're looking at North Rona. Um, so there are some real important hornout sites in, in the Isle of May as well. So, you know, very important habitat for seals around the UK. Next slide, please. Seals are, are incredibly vigilant. Um, sometimes, as you can see here, they haul out on beaches and there'll be seals piled up on each other sleeping, but there'll always be one or two on the lookout and they have incredible senses. Uh, they will pick people up from very long distances. They, you know, bright colors, noise, uh, many of these things and smell, they, they, they smell very, very well indeed. So uh, they can pick up on people being around. And although you'll see trip boats that go out regularly to the habituated to carefully handle boats, and therefore it, it, they are less likely to be disturbed, but you turn up on your kayak and they spook. So why is that? Next slide, please. Well, seals have a phenomenal sense of smell and they'll hit some first smell something, then hear and then see an approach. So wind direction, so a wind blowing on shore from a, a boat traveling offshore or people on a cliff with the wind blowing down into a, a, a seal hall outside will be picked up. And bright clothing on boats oftentimes, um, sensible operators tell people on the boat to keep quiet 
stay down low in the boat and if they've got really bright clothing on maybe take it off or turn it inside out because it, it causes less disturbance so they're all factors difficult thing because sometimes they take a long time to settle down after a disturbance event and you might turn up an hour or so later seals just take off but you don't know what happened a couple of hours ago so you have to be use seal craft and, and watch from a, a careful distance and keep down low so you're not obvious so the disturbance will be increased if you, you, with, there are big groups uh, of people downwind where it's quiet and so any sound will travel and carry and i saw some video film this last year of um, a rigid inflatable boat traveling offshore at you know, sensible speed and some seals ashore were absolutely panicked by it and they must have been 600 meters away it was extraordinary there was just a light onshore wind and the noise came in and it, it, it disturbed them so don't be surprised if they appear spooky that's because they are next slide please So there are vulnerable seal growths. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when, when seals haul out, they often haul out uh, as the tide is falling. And when the tide falls completely, uh, especially in places like Bristol Channel, for example, or even up here where tidal ranges can be really big, animals hauled out ashore are, are very vulnerable. Uh, if they're on beaches, if they get stampeded, they may have to travel across rocks for considerable distances suffering injuries. Pregnant females are very much at risk here um, for obvious reasons. Um, pounding over rocks, launching themselves off uh, high water rocks is uh, especially if they get separated. Um, then if they get separated from their pups, A, this is why a lot of pups have to, have to be rescued, but also too, it does have an effect on the viability of pups and their ability to survive. And juveniles, surprisingly, because they're still pretty basic and not terribly good at, uh, you know, learning their way of, of, of looking after themselves until they've got a few years on. And they're not carrying the fat reserves that they need to see them through lean times. So disturbance of those animals can be a serious problem. So there are a number of things to think about here. One is, you, if you think in terms of the seasons, uh, in the Hebrides, for example, I think the pupping season is pretty late, it's sort of September onwards but you'll have pregnant females before that. So be very careful um, to pick, if you're near known haul-out sites, and it's worth finding out where haul-out sites are, and at those times of year, just avoid them, because that then will let the animals uh, get through their natural cycle as, with as little disturbance as possible. Um, and uh, certainly be very, very careful uh, in bays, and places where there are seals hauled out, particularly can suffer injuries. So pick high water. Don't pick the, the dodgy times of the year where the seals could be affected and uh, enjoy them when you see them. Uh, next slide, please. So what does disturbance look like? This is a very simple example of it, and it shows roughly what we call now. This is a small group of harbour seals in Loch Scavade on Skye. And they're hauled out on the rocks here, as you can see. And they're just looking around. You can see there is a, a young one at the back there, fast asleep. Others are just dozing. But two of them have started to look at something. And that something is us. So they are looking out and they're wondering, you know, what's going on? Is this a threat? And is it uh, going to cause any disturbance? Now, trip boats go in and out of Loch Scavick all the time, right the way past this haul out and never bother the animals because they're, hand they're well handled, they keep quiet, and the seals have got used to those boats, they're recognizing. They don't recognize anyone else. So when you're new, when you're on a paddleboard, when you're on a kayak particularly, or potentially, next slide please. And you can see here, by now, everybody's awake and everybody's wondering what's going on. And this is what we call the tripwire moment. This is when, if you move away quietly, the seals might settle down again and relax, or 
potentially you disturb their rest, they'll go into the water. Some of them, particularly not so much here, but in uh, water, they might become injured. And so this is the moment you, where you've got to make the decision. Are we bothering these animals or should we move away? And if you're in any doubt, move away. And then this is what happens when they start going. And this isn't even a bad event, by the way. This is relatively benign. Um, in places like West Cornwall on the North Cornwall coast, where there is a big range of tide, seals uh, tombstone off high rocks and they almost always suffer bad injuries. Next slide, please. This means you've got it wrong. If this happens, that's it. Now, one last thing. When you approach seal sites, be quiet and do not take dogs because dogs will chase seals. And that's what happened in this particular occasion. And this video isn't showing very fast, but believe me, it's real panic. And this is a youngster that has had to stampede across rocks. You can see injuries to their flippers. Many of them uh, suffer bad infections. And uh, you know, seal life isn't all easy, easy going. And another thing too is, uh, whatever you do, wherever you are, don't feed seals. It really isn't good news. It habituates not everybody likes them. Next slide, please. But when they're in the water, they're in their element. Um, and so high water, when you're around animals, you'll often find they'll come around and have a look at you. Sometimes they can be quite they can be quite rough, particularly the bulls. They'll butt divers. Uh, they'll often bite flippers. Uh, and I know a number of academics who consider that um, swimming and being in the water with seals is a pretty risky business because seals are known to uh, be engaged now in cannibalism with, with other seals um, called corkscrew seals that we thought were probably getting caught in propellers and the like. It looks now almost certainly that that was caused by, by cannibalism. So. Um, they look lovely, they appear like friendly um, Labradors, but that's not necessarily the case. We invest what we think we'd like to know on animals, but sometimes at our cost. But certainly when they're in the water, they feel far less vulnerable and they're much, much more inquisitive. So they'll often gather around and just watch you. Just okay, to next slide, please. Slightly, uh, Colin, at the moment, we've just got about five minutes um, left um of the we we're coming up to nine o'clock oh, shortly so just to, to let okay. you know <laughs> we might need to cut it short <laughs> okay i'll speed up so here's some messages for you kayaks and swimmers and land-based watches why are they wary of kayaks they're quiet they change predict direction fast they can resemble a predator so keep quiet maintain a low profile if you have to paddle past do it smoothly quietly and steadily and be aware of the pupping season and stay away from those sites at those times. Next one, please. So birds, birds are highly protected. Um, and uh, next slide, please. You need to be careful around birds, not just in terms of injury to the birds, but often their nest sites as well. Uh, birds like guillemots, if they're disturbed off their ledges, uh, often that will leave uh, a chick or eggs vulnerable to predators like hooded crows, like ravens, black back gulls, skewers. Next slide, please. It looks like we're stuck with this one. <laughs> well, the, the thing with birds, and, and there are many birds, so it, it, another point about wild swimming and uh, kayaking and so on and so forth is, is where you land or where you go into the water, be very careful to stick to established paths because there's lots of ground nesting birds around at the nesting season. Be aware of when nesting season is and what, avoid some of those sites. If you know it's a, a bird nesting site, go elsewhere for that period. There's plenty of other places to visit. Uh, equally, it's true that small birds on the water like this little razorbill chip are very vulnerable. Next slide, please. If you disturb the mother and the mother goes away, then you leave the door open to a predator, like a, a great skewer here, a boxy, 
that will come along and they kill lots of birds out in the water like this every time. So go around them, don't disturb them. Next slide, please. So these are the simple clues, close to the birds any time or stay, stay too long and be respectful of the birds on the water. Next slide, please. In our, some of the areas around the UK now, we have reintroduced fantastic, magnificent birds like this white-tailed eagle. And we used to think that they were incredibly uh, bold around humans, but as they've been successive generations, they've got wilder and wilder, and they're now much more nervous. And you need to be extremely cautious around some of their, their nests. They're highly protected and uh, people are always watching them. So disturbance of, of these type of birds is very much to be avoided. Next one, please. Otters are recovering well around the UK. And the worry with them is that they're fine in the water. They're not really bothered by it, but they don't like having the route to their halt. The trap. Be aware that, that uh, they will not like it if you get between them and their halt when they're ashore. Uh, they're pretty bold. They're much less nervous than you might imagine. I watch one down on the shore here all the time, and it's really not that bothered by people. Next slide, please. Britain is blessed with the most extraordinary range of marine and sea and seabird life, seals, basking sharks, you name it. We have it all here. It's one of the richest uh, natural parts of our habitat left. And it's really, we're very lucky that we have it to play in, on and under. But if we want to really enjoy it, as we've known from the past, we can, and, and we see the wonderful array of wildlife that's there. All we have to do is be careful and be respectful of the wildlife and be safe and enjoy yourselves out on the water. So thank you very much for coming along. If there's time for a question, I'll answer it. If not, I'm sorry that I spoke too long. <laughs> not at all. Um, that was really interesting. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, there's there's probably a few burning questions about seals again, as that, that was very um, popular. <laughs> um, so I'm going to just take it from the point of a swimmer. Um, often when we're out, we see them coming round us and they come up behind us or very close. Sometimes they might even touch your your feet. Um, and we've got an occasion, we, we've got an instance of a swimmer where a, a seal followed her all the way out. She was she was trying to get out of the water and it followed her all the way out and actually sort of grabbed the back of her, her legs. Can you explain anything about that situation, what might have happened there? I, I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I'm concerned that uh, some, of course, Seals are probably like every other creature in that you'll have animals that are, that are a bit more bold. Sometimes it's juveniles because like teenagers everywhere, they're a little bit more nervous. But at the same time, there may be habituation involved. Yeah. Of relationship. Um, my concern is that somebody may get bit one day and um, mm. it, it probably won't be provoked. It, it might be just that uh, and so there's a, mistake, and the, you know, a, a mistake made. I saw a piece of video film of, a, of uh, an area where there were seals in a harbour that were being regularly fed with fish from the harbour side. And a child went to feed the fish and how it did lose its hand, I have no idea. Oh my goodness. And yet, you know, people would blame the seal, but I mean, yeah. you know, it's a thing. So I, I'm always cautious about things. And I would say one thing, which has always been my own philosophy, and that is that these are wild animals. Never um, we don't necessarily want to make them our pets. That doesn't help. Yeah. Um, and the, someone is saying that people are being bitten. There are reports of people being bitten. And I do know that it's harbour seals that, that they're maybe habituated um, and they're just used to, to humans being around. So there's, um, there's a few reports of some bites going on. So, so what could we do? Is there anything we can do if, the, if we see a seal and it's just being a little bit too playful? Is there, is there any behavior that we could do that could uh, protect us and them? Well, I, I would imagine that you, would, you should try and shoo it away. And it might be a hard slap on the water, might, might shift it away and okay. just keep, keep them from getting too close to you. 
Um, okay. I'm no expert on this. I've never swum with a seal and, and I don't know, but certainly I know that where there are operations where people swim with seals, that they're very, very careful about safety and they have you know, protocols to make sure that people stay safe. But I, I do uh, seals biting them. It certainly isn't too bad because a really bad seal bite uh, would put you in hospital. And they have a, a lot of really nasty bacteria in their mouths and on their teeth. And uh, infection is the major one. Yeah. So get yourself to A&E. If anybody does experience anything, get straight to A&E and you might need a tetanus shot or something like that. Because um, I'm aware that they're full of bacteria as well. So just in case anyone else isn't. Um, so we, we're, we're probably a couple of minutes over now. So... Um, Claire, I don't know if you've been answering quite a lot of questions there and if anybody's got a couple more, if, if we've got time um, to stay on. <laughs> I know some people will be heading off. That's been over an hour now. I've got to say, some of your guys have had the most amazing encounters. You are so lucky. Uh, but particularly with regard to seals, we get quite a lot of them down here in Cornwall and um, you just need to be really, really careful. If they approach you, let them do it on their own terms, but be aware they're probably going to be younger seals. There's three kinds of ways they might approach you. Younger seals being really curious and coming to see what you're all about. Bull seals who are thinking that you are in their territory, in which case move away. And um, female seals who are new mums who are going to be worried about you being in the vicinity of their pups. When their pups are young, both Harbour and Grey, they're often still on the beaches. So really be careful about and avoid those areas if you can. That'd be great. Thanks, Claire. I, th I think that's a summary of what people are, are looking for for seals. Um, but all the, all the information this evening has been amazing and it's really going to open our eyes to um, protecting the environment, which we love. We, we really love the sea <laughs> um, and we, we are becoming more and more aware of marine mammals yeah. and what our responsibilities are. So um, we, we will definitely be sharing this presentation um, with, with more wild swimmers just so that the, there's more awareness about what we can do to, to protect things. So I think maybe a take home message and you, you'll, you'll probably hopefully agree with this is, is basically just keep your distance, respect. Um, if anything approaches you, you know, don't do anything sudden, don't touch. Um, because a lot of people think that marine mammals, you know, it's amazing to see them and they want to touch them and get close. Um, would you advise us just avoid that, just let them do what they're doing? And yeah, that's what we thought. <laughs> yeah, because it, it does, you know, it's, it's we're curious too. <laughs> um, so just to reiterate that, that's great. Steve, have you got anything to add this evening? No, just just to say that was amazing, uh, Colin and Claire. Thank you very much. Really, really interesting, really informative. I feel much more prepared uh, in and around the water. So that was really, really good. Thank you very much. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm just seeing... Thanks so much for inviting me. And uh, stay safe, you all. Eh? Thank you so much, Colin. I'm going to be looking out for your book now. <laughs> Oh, and there was another question came in, seeing as uh, if you're okay, just for a second. Um, it was about your wise scheme, the, the courses for boat um, handlers. And so someone was asking, are you thinking, could you maybe possibly do one for um, kayakers, paddle boarders? Because paddle boarding is really, really popular um, and it's increasing. We have been working on a, a new course and this is being developed by Claire and uh, another great friend, Miles Farnbank, based up here in Scotland, both of whom know more about the subject than, than I ever would. And they have been developing what we call the adventure course. And that is for people who are involved in exactly the type of activities that you're involved in and kayaks, paddleboards, uh, climbers, wild swimmers, mm. you name it. It's specifically aimed at the people. And then we have the boat-based course, which is called the Standard Course, which is being run by Hibbardine Well and Dolphin Trust. And there will be online versions of the courses and active versions of the courses. And uh, yeah, absolutely. We certainly would welcome anybody to come and attend our courses. That sounds really good. Um, I'm interested in that myself. Um, so we'll, we'll be sharing that when, when we know more about this. Um, so just a reminder to everybody, if you do have any sightings of any mammals, you can report them in, in is it just in Scotland, to the Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust. We'll send some links out in our emails after this. 
Um, and we thank you very much for everybody attending. We'll probably have to close it down now um, and let people get off. <laughs> We're really grateful for both of you attending tonight and Colin for your presentation. It was brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Take care.